I could start with one. So how often do you see multiple confirmations and you do single particle? Uh, question is, how often do you see multiple confirmations? And when we, were, when we, we have focused our little group um, trying to improve the methods, so we've picked specimens which we thought did not have multiple conformations. So beta galactosidase, these electron transport proteins in membranes, but many other people, particularly the ribosome people, they have ratcheting, they have uh, three different tRNAs coming in, elongation factors, release factors. Um, so um, most of the more, uh, let's say, biologically oriented structural biology projects have structures that are mobile. They're little machines and they change. So a good, good one that I didn't show was the, uh, the ATP synthase, the rotary motor. So the F1, FO, ATP synthase. And that was another one we looked at, tried to look at in uh, year 2000. John Rubenstein was a student with John Walker and I. And we, we, after a lot of work, got a 30 angstrom map in 2003. And then John Rubenstein went to Toronto, built up a cryo-M group in Canada, and gradually got it from 30 angstroms to 18 to 15 to 7. And now they have a, a 3.9 angstrom or 4 angstrom map. And, and with the rotary motor, uh, because the, uh, the rotor rotates 360 degrees and they've got alpha 3, beta 3 in the head group, it goes into three predominant states. But there are other states as well. And so uh, with most of these little biological machines, there are... Let's say, I mean, I think they've got seven states in the F1, FA, OEA, TPAs, V1, VO. The ribosome people often have uh, half a dozen states. And even in structures like this gamma secretase, if it's flexible because it's in a membrane, you get a big advantage, even, if, even though that may not be part of its biological function. You get a big advantage in sorting it out in the computer. So I would say, you know, the, the number of structures for which you've got one rigid structure, many enzymes will be like that because the enzyme is just, you know, the active site is the, uh, the complementary fit to the transition state of the substrate. It may not do a big structural change, but allosteric enzymes are often doing very big changes, but you can often trap it in one state and then in the other state, and then in the EM, you're only doing a little bit of this 3D classification, but it's a very powerful method, and probably in the longer term, virtually everything will need that. And, and actually, most people do that anyway. So uh, how do you rule out, uh, when you see multiple confirmations, how do you rule out them arising from the problems you describe? Yeah. From damage or other factors? I mean, that's, in a way, it's, it's the same kind of problem, the same kind of question. How do you know the structure you've got is real? Or has it been perturbed by the methodology? And in the early days of crystallography, people said, proteins don't crystallize. They're floating around in the cytoplasm. They're doing their enzyme reaction. The crystal state cannot possibly be the right state. So what happened was that people would crystallize, say, ribonuclease in 20 different crystal forms. And they would look at it, and the structure was more or less identical, slight changes due to the crystal packing. And so the same would be true here. The, the big worry in electron cryo microscopy is that the, th the thin film has um, a very energetically unfavorable air-water interface on the two surfaces. And so many of the proteins that we've tried to work on, you, you know it's well behaved, uh, you do uh, gel filtration, you do biochemistry, uh, chrom column chromatography, you get a really nice peak, it's well behaved, the structure lasts for weeks, you plunge freeze it onto a thin film and it's fallen apart. And that's, we think, because it's denaturing at the air-water invasion. So then you have to try and work around it. Uh, and so, yeah, you're, you're basically trying to correlate what you see with what you expect. And if it doesn't agree, then there's a problem and you have to worry about it. But there is no, there's no way de novo of knowing whether it's real or not. You have to you know, integrate it. That, but that's the same for NMR x-rays. So it's a general problem, yeah. Any more questions? There's one there. So the first question is that in the last, uh, the uh, last but one slide, you, your graph shows that radiation damage, then uh, the pseudo-Brownian motion of water, 
and I think uh, charge build up, no, not charge build up. Yeah. Something else. So the first three, they are not entirely removable. So you 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 can't get to B factor zero, right? You can never get to a B factor of zero because you always be so. Well, you can, but but the image would have no electrons in it, and so you wouldn't have any structure. Yes. <coughs> Uh, Excuse me. So, I mean, our, our hope is that um, we'll get rid of... The main problem is this beam-induced specimen motion. You put the beam on and it blurs, particularly at the beginning, and then eventually after about 10, it settles down. There's not much. This beam-induced specimen motion stops after about 10, and, but, but you've lost the very best part that you should have where the structure is undamaged. Um, so, um, if you could get rid of that, um, you might not need to use 25. You could perhaps use 10 electrons per square inch. And if you look at this B factor, if you look at this bottom curve at the moment, and the people are using all 25, you say the average is about here. So, yeah. the average is a B factor of about, oh, minus 120 or so. Some of the better structures, where this has been minimized, you get a B factor of about 100 uh, relative to... Uh, what it should be. But if you could um, make the images better, get rid of this beam-induced motion, you could probably use the first, uh, say, five or ten, and then you would have a, a B factor between zero and about um, minus 50. So the average might be 25 or 30. So what we think is that when everything's been completely cured, other than radiation damage, you'll collect your images, you'll calculate your structure, and the, the B factor will be about 30. Yeah. And if you work out what is the gain in information between a B factor of 30, which we hope to get to one day, and a B factor of about 90 or 100, which is what we have now, uh, it works out that at about uh, three and a half angstrom resolution, uh, that's about a factor of 20 to 30. So that means you'll need 20 to 30 times less images if they're of a higher quality or can be the motion the blurring can also be removed in the computer. Right. But at the moment, and people do this, they do motion correction of the movies that you can get with the new detectors. But at the beginning, um, the, the algorithms, well, the signal-to-noise ratio in the image and the algorithms are not together good enough. And the detectors, they also have what they call fixed pattern noise that, that are not to do with the specimen, they're to do with defects in the detector. So all, basically, if all of these technical things are removed, it will be a lot better. And so, but, but nobody's done it yet, so I think it's still for the future. Uh, so one thing about radiation damage, so when, so you have first plunge freezed your specimen, right? right. And then you are irradiating with, with the electrons. Yeah. So at that point of time, is it not uh, frozen? Like, do you have, uh, a cryo, uh, uh, the specimen in the cryogenic medium? You mean at the, at the first point when you freeze it? No, so after the freezing, uh, while you are irradiating, oh, yes. is it still in the cryogenic medium? Oh yes, it's still... The, the temperature does not increase when you put the beam on it. The beam is very, very mild. And so the temperature would be, let's say, would be liquid nitrogen, say so minus 190 degrees Celsius. You put the beam on, it's still 190 Celsius. But each electron that goes into the specimen and does an inelastic scatter deposits maybe 30 or 40 electron volts of energy locally at one point. Right. And so that little part of the specimen heats up locally and bonds break and you know things can move around. And then after probably a microsecond, it's back down to minus 90. So it's just briefly heated up by the radiation damage. And that's uh, probably not the cause of this, uh, this motion. <coughs> we think the two, the two likely causes of the beam-induced motion, which <coughs> you have to um, try to cure, is that when you plunge freeze the specimen at the very beginning, before it goes anywhere near the microscope, the, um, the protein molecules, when you freeze them, they all shrink. <coughs> Excuse me, and it's known from X-ray crystallography. You can do room temperature. You go down to liquid nitrogen. The unit cell dimensions get smaller by about one percent. So the protein is shrinking by about three percent, the three dimensions. But water, when you cool it, 
the most dense point of water is four degrees centigrade, which is ice, ice floats on the top of the pond. So when you freeze it, crystalline ice or the amorphous ice that we do, the density drops to about 0.9 or 0.92 grams per cc. So when that plunge freezing happens, the protein is shrinking, but the water is expanding. Mm. And so there is a very, and, and that all happens in a fraction, you know, a tenth of a millisecond or a hundredth of a millisecond. So probably you are creating stresses by the freezing procedure. Right. So one idea that nobody has tried yet is that instead of freezing it in pure water or pure buffer, uh, some of the crystallographers, you, you, you have an additive. So for example, if you add a little bit of ethylene glycol, it turns mm -hmm. out that does not, exp if you add 25% mm -hmm. ethylene glycol, it doesn't expand by 10% when you cool it. It's kind of um, uh, sort of uh, super cooled and, it, and amorphous, and it, it, it shrinks also a little bit. So one of the lists of experiments that are planned is to try doing additives to see. But the other way that this beam-induced motion might occur is that even if there was no differential uh, expansion or contraction on the point of freezing, so there were no stresses, uh, and you put the beam on it, you're still breaking bonds. So if you have a methyl group on the end of a valine, the carbon-hydrogen bond breaks, and that goes from one and a half angstrom, or 1.1 angstrom, goes to about three angstroms. And then carbon-carbon bonds break, break, and they go from one and a half to three and a half. So things go from being covalently bonded to being in van der Waals contact. And that expands the specimen. And so you create, at the point of the radiation, you're creating internal pressure. And so it's, it's trying to explode because of all the bonds breaking. But it's frozen, so it can't. So these stresses cause the thin film, for example, we know it, 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 it goes upwards and forms a little uh, dome. It, it moves up by one or 200 angstroms, actually, due to uh, the bond breakage in the rate. So all of these things are not fundamental. The radiation damage is fundamental, yeah. but the consequences of it you may be able to get round by making the environment for your protein or your protein complex so rigid and strong that even though it's trying to expand, it only expands less. And, and all we need to, to cure this problem, at the moment, things are moving a few angstroms. If you can make it two or three times less, the problem will be completely cured. So I think, you know, um, I think we're, quite, we're reasonably optimistic about it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not a scientist, nor a student of science, but when I read in the newspaper that Richard Henderson, Nobel Prize winner, is making a presentation, I decided to come, come. along <laughs> to Sam, my husband. And I'm very delighted to hear your presentation, uh, Richard. Thank you so much. Um, I have a simple question to ask you. Obviously, there's so much interest from you know, students and faculty in India uh, about pure sciences. And no Indian has ever won a Nobel Prize. You probably know the secret of winning a Nobel Prize. Do you want to share it with us, please? I think you didn't. Uh, is it Ramakrishnan? Uh, does Ramakrishnan have a Nobel Prize? Yes. I think so. I think, I mean, there, I think there are a few, and there's some... Um, one of the particle physics, you know, there's two or three actually. I mean, I think the, the, obviously it helps to be. So when I was a student, um, I wondered what kind of, I was from physics. I wondered what kind of physics would be interesting, you know, because there are lots of, you know, there's plasma physics. You could make a fusion reactor like in the sun, make unlimited energy. You can do solid state physics and all the computers and the iPhones that we all have based on solid state, you know, millions of transistors that didn't exist in the, in the 50s. Uh, astrophysics, cosmology, we have the gravity waves now. So there are hundreds of wonderful things, actually. So I looked around and decided about 1965, and so when I was an undergraduate, that I thought biophysics was a good direction to go into. But I didn't know about structural biology. And then I looked around in the UK. I went to visit various labs. And the one that I'm still at in Cambridge, I went to visit on a Saturday morning, and they're all working. You know, the, whereas I, other places I visited in London and Norwich, uh, on a weekday, by five o'clock, they were all going home. So I thought, this is definitely a better lab. 
So I canceled all my applications to all the other places <coughs> and ended up in Cambridge. And actually, um, they said, you know, uh, what good is molecular biology for mankind? It'll never be very useful. And they had, when it started about, oh, six months after the lab opened, uh, Watson, Craig, Kendrew, and Perutz were given a chemistry and physiology or medicine Nobel Prizes. But it took another, oh, 20 years before other Nobel. But now, actually, there's about 15 or 16 Nobel Prizes. So one, the two key things, I think, and also I should say I spent, against my will, I spent 10 years being the director of the lab, uh, trying to recruit people, trying to go in good directions, trying to make sure the money kept flowing. But the thing that John Kendrew said, the most important thing is to have a, a flow of money that never, never goes away. Because then you can do longer term projects that are more highly high risky. S students still have to get their PhDs and publish papers. So they may be uh, little parts of the research that is divided up. But if you've got a vision, an important problem to tackle, and then you've got somebody funding it. So I think um, picking a good lab where people are interested in their work, they're not paid very much, but they're very motivated for their work, and then they're tackling important long-term problems, I think that's the key, actually. And it doesn't matter which, which country you're, that you're in. Um, I mean, I think uh, last year we had the, there was a Nobel Prize for artemisinin from the, the lady in China who was more of a technical person, but they had pursued a really important problem, you know, how to get a treatment for malaria, and that really worked out quite well. So I think just doing research that's, that's intrinsically interesting to you, but of course you can't do it without, you will starve if you aren't paid. So you need to have, uh, so even in the UK, which has a long track record of really good science, um, it's, it's considered by government very important that the country has to be economically successful and economically powerful. Because without a good, strong economy, you cannot have the money to go into research. And so I think whenever we... So we, we talk to the ministers and the, you know, the people from education and so on quite a lot. Um, and, and, and we don't ask for more money unless we know the economy is doing... So when we, we wanted... We have a new lab building now. And we asked... We said this would be a good idea in 1999, but the economy was bad. So we waited 1999, 2000, eventually in 2004, somehow or other there was a little uh, optimism. So then we said, ah, we must ask for the money now. And we asked for it and it was approved. And then 2008 came, the global credit crunch. And so we had a window of only four years. So you have to um, be aware of uh, other areas outside your own work, and, and, you, and maybe you have to delay the request for money for a new facility until it looks like it's going to work. Because if you ask for it in a bad time and they say no, very difficult to go back. So somehow or other, you have to keep it going until... And, 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 but I think actually... Uh, the, the, and then John Kendrew said in 1953, he said he couldn't understand it. They never solved the structure from 1946 to 1957. Nothing. You know, they, they didn't solve anything. And, but yet, the money kept flowing. And that was partly that in the wartime, Second World War, science had been very important in, um, in, in warfare. So after the war had finished, they said, OK, well, maybe we can use these same type of long-term planning for science. So they put a lot of money into biophysics, structural biology, and so on. And then, and then it was a long-term vision. So I think those are the two. Make sure the money flows and then have a long-term vision. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. yeah, I have one question. There are three techniques that you compared, the NMR, the imaging technique, and the X-ray um, okay. crystallography. So uh, has there been an attempt to solve the same structure by three and oh, yes. then try to understand the conflicts of analysis? Yeah. And is it the functionality, biofunctionality, which decides which is getting better and which is worse? Uh -huh. That is one question. And the other small question is, uh, regarding this charge fluctuation, etc., many uh, systems we do sometimes, which are insulating, they add a little bit of conducting matter. So, for example, in making the sample, if you add a little bit of carbon nanotubes or something, will that help? Yeah. Yeah, so um, we always thought that um, it would be nice if just 
not necessarily because it would be better, but it would be a nice demonstration if uh, one structure was solved by all three methods. And um, we were particularly keen that if Max Perutz, unfortunately, who died about uh, 14 years ago or so, but we thought it would be really nice if somebody could use cryo-EM to determine the structure of hemoglobin. And we thought this was still quite in the future because hemoglobin is quite small, 64 kilodaltons. But there was a, a student about a year ago in Germany in Martin Street called Miriam Koshai. She said, we've got these, I didn't talk about it at all, but they have a, in Martin Street, they developed another type of optical uh, contribution to cryo called a phase plate, which gives you, doesn't help you at high resolution, but gives you a lot of contrast at low resolution so that you can see the particles and find the orientation and so on. She decided that she would like to look at hemoglobin. So she ordered some hemoglobin from Sigma. It comes as a dry brown powder. It's, it's, it's oxidized and so on and so on. And her PhD supervisor and the director said, oh, no, that's rubbish. Don't do that. <laughs> but she just ignored them and put, made a sample, put it in on Friday, collected the images all of the weekend, and on Monday they were able to compute a 3.5 extra structure of hemoglobin, uh, you know, 15 years after Max had died. So, th so there is that. And then there's a lot of NMR work that's been done on, on hemoglobin and myoglobin and so on. So there are, and then bacteria drops in the protein that I worked on initially using electron, 2D electron crystallography. Uh, that, about eight or nine years later, they finally got crystals and there's now... If you look in the protein data bank, of the 140,000 <laughs> deposited coordinates, about 150 of them are copies of bacteria dopsin. And about six of them are done by electron crystallography. About 140 have been done by X-ray crystallography. Usually most of them on there's several crystal forms, but one mainly. And then there are NMR people in, in Berlin who've been doing, and they have quite a good NMR structure, not so good resolution though. So I think at the moment, if you're starting on a new project, probably, you know, you don't get much material. It may not be very pure. I think probably nowadays, most people are now starting. So it's become a method. The cryo-EM is a method of first choice. And then, but if you want to do hundreds of structures, for example, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you're trying to make an antiviral compound against, uh, you know, for example, um, uh, a, a virus protease, HIV protease, and so on. Once you've got one crystal, you can soak it in hundreds of compounds very quickly. So with these modern synchrotrons now, you can do maybe three or four hundred structures per day in one day, whereas the EM, usually it's about one a day. So it's still about 300 times slower, but only if you've got a crystal that's well-behaved, and then the EM will improve in speed. And so then the second question about can you help with charging? Um, I mean, there, I, so I, I did, I said, we, you know, there's charge fluctuations and charge buildup. So actually, Chris Roos and I just have, we have three papers just uh, in, in ultra microscopy. One is on the charge buildup, one is on the charge fluctuations, and then a third one is on a thing called Evolt sphere curvature, which is um, a 3D problem that has limited the resolution, but, but now no longer does. And we've measured the charge buildup, we've measured the fluctuations, and they are measurable, but we don't think, if you do the specimens correct, that's why we've now got relatively, so that, that little gap there for, you know, this green thing, the green, that gap is fairly small, and then this charge buildup only happens at the very beginning. So we don't think that's uh, so important, but Indeed, um, the idea of just mixing up your specimen with uh, carbon nanotubes uh, is quite a good idea. But an, an, uh, another idea that Chris Russo published recently is instead of using thin carbon films, you use thick gold films. And then the carbon is not a good conductor. And particularly if you cool it to liquid helium temperatures, it's a very, very bad conductor, and so is ice. But gold, thin films or thicker films of gold, they're, they get better and better conductors as you cool them. So I think there is a hope that some of these new specimen supports, thicker films of gold with smaller holes at liquid helium temperature, will, will, will be good enough. 
Um, but if they're not good enough, then you have to try other things like ad adding carbon nanotubes or something to try and drop down these charge buildup and fluctuations. I was trying to figure out where is exactly the breakthrough because field emission microscopes are around for a long time now. Right? Yeah. And the tungsten, uh, all kinds of field emitters are around and probably reached a stage where there was no possibility of improvement. So can you comment on this a bit? Yeah. So Which cathode it, uh, did the trick? Uh, yeah. So is the question is, uh, field emission guns and field emission sources have been around for a long time. Why did it take so long for biology? Yeah, okay. So um, I do remember in the 60s when people published the first images. Um, when I was a physics undergraduate, they had images uh, of the tip of a field emission gun where, where you're pulling out. You could see all the atoms and the crystalline structure of the tip. And in the, um, the work where we collected some images with Ken Downing and Bob Glazer around about 1988, the microscope they had was a very old microscope. It was a JOL, 100 kilovolt microscope, um, but they had a field emission gun on it. It had a very bad vacuum. They couldn't cool it very, they couldn't cool it to liquid nitrogen temperature. The vacuum was very bad. They could cool it only to about minus 100. So actually a lot of our about a third or a, 40% of the images that went into that 1990 first reasonably high resolution map of the bacteriodopsin came from a JL100B with a field emission gun in 1980, but we were using it in 1988. And it was a as a result of that that we and others said to the manufacturers, we must have a field emission uh, higher voltage microscope with a good vacuum so that you could cool, cool it and so on. And in the early 1990s, so about 1992, 1993, um, some of us went round all the manufacturers, JL, Hitachi, Zeiss, uh, you know, uh, Philips, which was the FEI, and, and then we, we said we want a high voltage micro, it wasn't 300, 200 kV with field emission gun, and they didn't have them. The only company that had it was Hitachi in Japan. And so we bought a Hitachi in 1993 with a field emission gun, uh, you know, in a cold stage and a reasonably good vacuum. And the Philips company were extremely annoyed with us because before, no one had bought anything other than Philips. But we told them that even if you give us a microscope, we don't want it. It's rubbish. And obviously, other people said the same thing. So they then, put, they then spent nearly 10 years putting a lot of effort into developing it. But it was only because of pressure, market competition, and customer demand that they, were, that they were able to do that. So for about three years, uh, we were no, more or less the only lab with a really good high voltage field emission gun microscope, all on film. And it was a cold field emitter. It was a very bad thing. You could take 20 images a day, and now people take 2,000 or something like that. So with these 20 images, that work that I told you that um, Bettina Boccia, who was, you know, was on an earlier slide, Bettina worked with Tony on the first sub-nanometer structure. That was done on this 200 kilovolt Hitachi with a field emission gun. And we were the only ones for about three or four years with that quality of data. All of the other people didn't get their field emission guns till later. So actually, there's a big advantage in having a technological lead. Uh, because once you've got it, you have it and nobody else has it. And so now, I think the, the question is, what would be, over the next few years, what are the new developments that you make sure that you have, uh, you're ready to do it? And, and, and we think that the detectors will get better and faster and bigger. And so when you're setting up a new facility, it's quite good to keep a little bit of money in, in a, a pot so that you can upgrade uh, the detectors in the future. So, so I think it wasn't... There was nothing fundamental about it. It was the, the companies, they build what they think you want, um, and then if they build the wrong thing, they don't sell it, and then they, you know, so, so it, it's, it, it's no different from a new car or a new uh, television or a new phone. Uh, so the, the cryo EM equipment has the same need for uh, doing, building what the customer wants, and building it economically and with a good performance to compete with the other manufacturers. Common to all the three problems you mentioned uh, is the problem of uh, reconstruction. 
So no matter what technique you're using, yeah. you'll have to solve the inverse problem. Yeah. Uh, so is there any specific advantage of using an electron cryo uh, EM technique where this problem actually can be attacked more efficiently? Because all said and done, this problem still exists. It does, yeah. Nobody has. So the question is, um, <laughs> what you've got are images that have got all sorts of electron optical uh, effects that change the image from what you would like, uh, let's say a proper projection, um, and then you have to say, well, what is the 3D structure that gives you these projections? Uh, and it's easy to go from the 3D structure to the projections, but to go from the projections back to the 3D structure, it's not so easy. So there are all sorts of um, corner-cutting algorithms at the moment which avoid this inverse problem. They don't do it. And in principle, it is possible to write a series of something like you know, a million or two million square matrix uh, that you have to invert to get these, but no one is doing that. All, all, everybody, what everyone is doing at the moment is you take the images, you make a rough structure, and then iteratively you refine it to, uh, to make it ag agree with it. So, um, you know, there are uh, people who are interested in solving that problem. Uh, but, th but at the moment, there are about six or seven different sets of software that, that get around the problem in different ways. Um, and, but, you know, even without that inverse problem, there are still other problems. And, and one of these papers that I mentioned that, you know, Chris Russo and I just uh, uh, have it now in press or uncorrected proofs are published, is uh, that the images that you take, they're not projections of the structure, actually, because the wavelength of the electrons, x-rays is worse, x-rays one angstrom, one and a half angstrom. The electrons at 300 kV is 0 0.02 angstroms, and at 100 kV, 0 0.04 angstroms. So actually, um, when you put the beam through, the, the diffracted beams come out of, at an angle, and the one that comes out to the right and to the left are actually being reflected off slightly different Fourier components in the structure. And this is either, you call it, you know, the Bragg's Law or the Evolt sphere curvature and so on. And, and all of the software, all of it at the moment, ignores that. And they pretend that the image you get is a projection of the structure. And as, that's fine to about four or five angstroms. But as you get to three angstroms and two angstroms, it becomes more important. So in this paper, what we're suggesting is if you take the images with a slightly greater amount of defocus than you normally take, the, the diffracted beams that come out and that are focused back to, go, to form the image, they're not quite focused back. So actually, the two diffracted beams are actually recorded separately on different parts of the film. And, and so you can process them differently. And so Shores had just programmed this into rely on. And indeed, you get another quarter of an angstrom better resolution. But that's not at very high resolution. So there are, there, there is still, I would say, I mean, there's this business about phase plates. Um, there's, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the phase shift of the diffracted beams that are not exactly 90 degrees when you scatter. So there, there's some fundamental physics as well as the fundamental math. So actually, the great thing now is that Lots of clever people who were X-ray crystallographers are now starting to come in to do cryo-EM. And so the pace of change in, in all levels, the maths, the physics, the specimen, the microscope, so it's, it's picked up now. So things are moving much more rapidly than they were. So I think people are, you know, they've picked up that excitement and that enthusiasm. So I think we're all pretty optimistic about it. But Indeed, somebody needs to get a really big computer and a really efficient inversion al algorithm and try and do it analytically rather than this uh, iterative successive approximation that they're doing at the moment. So if there are no further questions, please join me in thanking Richard for a fascinating description of Kyrian. Thank you.